It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After the podcast, check out everything ChristianQuestions.com has to offer. Also see our weekly video series releases at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Here's your hosts, Rick and Jonathan. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. Joining me as always is Jonathan, my co-host, for more than two decades. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. Jonathan, what's our topic for today's episode? This is part one of a two-part series. Did God make heaven and hell humanity's destiny? Our theme text, Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Joining us today also is Julie. Hi, gentlemen. You know, many Christians envision the afterlife as a binary concept of either heaven or hell. So I'm looking forward to exploring this topic to see if the Bible agrees with that common tradition. Okay, so let's get started. Coming up in today's podcast, many Christians think the earth will be burned up. But what if we could prove the Bible says something entirely different? Find out what this proof is in about 15 minutes. What does heaven look like for the followers of Jesus? There are some surprising details revealed in Scripture. We'll tell you what they are, and that'll be in about 30 minutes. And what if we told you that most people who think about going to heaven actually won't? Why would we say that? We're going to talk about it in detail in about 45 minutes, but first let's lay some groundwork. The general consensus in Christianity is that there are two paths, two destinies that await humanity. First, there is the heavenly bliss of being with Jesus. After all, Jesus himself said that he was preparing a place for his followers. In heaven, in heaven and also he said he would bring us there. Second, there is the fiery, torturous, eternal existence of hell. This is reserved for everybody else who did not follow Jesus. While this two-destiny approach may sound simple, it does not stand the test of scrutiny. For starters, the fact that the vast majority of humanity has not known or accepted the name of Jesus, does this mean that God's careful creation of humanity in his image was a resounding failure? And what about planet Earth? If it's doomed for a fiery end, then why would Jesus tell us to pray for God's kingdom to come on Earth? These are just the beginning of some big questions, so let's see if we can find big biblical answers. And Jonathan and Julie, we're, get, we're stirring a big pot on this, on this podcast. There's a lot going on here. We're going to get into some things, folks, that maybe you've never heard before. So fasten your seatbelts. There's a lot coming at you here. There are several factors we need to put in place to reveal God's ultimate plan for humanity. So Jonathan and Julie, what are these factors? Well, we need to know the truth about heaven. Who goes to heaven? Why do they go there? And why others don't go there? We need to know the truth about hell. What does the Bible teach and what doesn't the Bible teach? We need to know the truth about earth. What is the earth's true destiny according to the Bible? And what does that mean for humanity? Okay, we can't answer all these questions in part one. So we're going to start with the earth. The Apostle Peter paints a dramatic picture of earth's destiny. Now, he lived 2,000 years ago, and he begins this prophecy by fast forwarding to conditions of the last days. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Overall, we're going to look at verses 3 to 13. Let's do Jonathan right now, verses 3 and 4. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So back then, Peter is saying it's going to come in the last days. People who are going to mock saying, yeah, God schmod, you know, what is it about him? You, you, you say that all these things are going to happen. Where is it? What's going on? So you, in ancient prophecies being mocked by self-centered people. Does that in any way sound familiar? Oh, yeah. 
sure kind, does. Of, kind of puts us right where we are in, in these last days. So Peter next reviews an ancient judgment that reminds us of God's ultimate control. Now pay attention to how this all begins to unfold and then tie together. We're in Second Peter chapter 3. Jonathan, let's do verses 5 and 6. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Okay, so you got to ask yourself, well, what was destroyed? The previous heavens and the previous earth. And we're going to suggest this is a symbolic destruction. The heavens being the spiritual and governmental ways of the, the world that existed before the flood, and the earth being humanity's social order. Those things were wiped out. Now, you know, the King James version of this verse six calls it the world that was. It says the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So we know that the actual ball of earth and the sky weren't literally destroyed. That's why we know it was some, a symbolic destruction. Okay. And, and yet he talks about he destroyed it with flood. But you're right. The sky and the physical terra firma still exist. Next, in Peter's prophecy, comes the destiny of the present heavens and earth. So we had the previous heavens and earth, now the destiny of the present heavens and earth, Jonathan, verses 7 and 8 of Second Peter 3. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. So we had that world that was. Now Peter's comparing it with the present heavens and earth, which is the world that is, the world we live in. The other was destroyed by, by flood. Now this one's reserved for fire. That sounds pretty scary. We've got this fire and destruction, and it sounds like it's going to last a thousand years. What does this mean? <laughs> Okay, um, and that's why we have to understand this verse is has got a lot of symbolism, and we're gonna we're gonna prove that as we go through. But just suffice it to say that you know it talks about the day this this day of judgment is a thousand years. It is not a day of reprimand and beating down and destruction for a thousand years. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of trial because that's what the word judgment actually means. And what we'd find in the day of judgment, it's actually. Big subject, another top, another another podcast. It's actually a day of reconciling because you're being tried and being shown what you need to deal with. So it truly isn't as scary as it sounds on the surface if we understand the meaning of the scripture. And again, we're well, gonna, go ahead, Julie. Well, let me just re re recommend episode 934. 934, will sinners be happy on Judgment Day? Because that'll give a lot more detail. Yeah, and that helps to open this up and explain it in some detail. Okay, now, Peter now reminds us of God's desire for life and his judgment upon sin. We're still in Second Peter chapter 3. Jonathan, let's do verses 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. And Rick, this translation is very poor, where it says not wishing. It really means not of the mind, not minded. Can you clarify that for us? So what it's actually saying, and I'm glad you brought up the thing about the translation, because it is, it's a poor translation. It's, it's basically saying, I'm going to give you a, a Rick translation here, okay? It's basically saying, God didn't have in his mind that all these people are going to perish. perish. He had in his mind an opportunity for repentance. In order for the repentance to happen, you have to take away all of the mess. And that's where this picture of of the intense heat comes and the destruction, quote unquote, of the earth comes, the destruction of the social order, because that's where all the mess comes from. You've got to remove it so that you can do something very productive. So it's not in God's mind to torment, torture, and, 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 uh, and look for this bleak end. Not at all. God's mind is very different than that. So we, we believe this, again, to be symbolic heat and burning showing the complete destruction of the way the world is run and social orders of this present world. 
And false religions. Yes. Yep. I think that's in there too. That gets burned up. And we know that it's a symbolic destruction because we already had that scriptural precedent that told us the first heavens and earth, that world that was, was destroyed. Right. Now the world that is will also be destroyed. So, Similar symbol. Go ahead. And the thing I liked was um, God is looking for that repentance you mentioned, Rick. That really takes the fear away. The day of judgment is hopeful for humanity. Yeah, and you know, go back to that other podcast because it focuses entirely on the day of judgment. And so we've got this burning up and this intense heat that a lot of us look at and say, whoa, see, this is what's going to happen to the earth. You got to think this through. And we're just laying the groundwork. Wait till the next segment, and we're going to really, really show you how the Bible supports the idea of this being symbolic. But let's just finish these verses. We're in Second Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 3 to 13. Uh, what should all of this mean for those who follow Jesus? So, Jonathan, let's go to verses 11 through 13. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. And uh, Rick and Julie have an observation, and that is there can't be righteousness dwelling in an abandoned property. <laughs> That makes sense. Well, and you think of when you think of righteousness and you think of God's righteousness, you also think of beauty. You think of perfection. You think of a pristine something and an abandoned, burned out property is not where you're going to have righteousness dwelling. So, folks, the scripture is showing us by itself that it is this part is symbolic, looking for new governing and new social order where God's will and way prevail. You know, and Jonathan, let's just take a minute. It said in that verse, verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed, what does that word actually mean? Well, Rick, it means to loosen. That's okay. it, to loosen. Okay, and so the idea of destroying things means when you loosen something, you, 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 you pull it off, you pull it away, you pull it away from its moorings and it's not recoverable. That's what happens to the present social order. That's what happens to the way the present evil world is run. It's pulled away and and it, and it's put out of commission. That's what this and, is talking about. And Rick, I looked up the Greek word for new, you know, for new heavens and yes. new earth. And what it means is new, especially in freshness. So it's a renewed earth, not a brand new earth. Just like you had the renewed earth earth, the renewed social order after the great flood. You see, you have this same thing repeating itself with different language for different reasons, but it all ties together in something very, very specific from God's plan. So, so this, symbolic, this is symbolic, which means the earth will not be destroyed. That leaves many more questions than answers. How can we be sure the earth won't be literally destroyed? Is there other scriptural proof? You know, one of the amazing things about the Bible is that across all of its books, it verifies the truths that it teaches. There is great power in one writer living in a specific time agreeing with other writers living at different times and in different places. We're going to look at seven different Old Testament Bible writers agreeing on the future destiny of the earth. So folks, this is where we get into, does the earth abide or does it get burnt up? Let's listen to all of these different scriptures. Zephaniah. Let's start with Zephaniah. Now, you know, we were just talking about Second Peter and, you know, fervent heat and, and melting and all of that sounded pretty, pretty ominous. Well, Zephaniah sure starts out seeming to prove the earth will be destroyed. Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness— Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Ouch. It's important to know that the book of Zephaniah has both literal warnings that happened in the Old Testament, but also prophetic warnings. And there was a judgment against Judah back then, but this gathering of all nations and pouring out of indignations on them never had a literal fulfillment, so it's yet future. So we believe this is referring to the coming day of global judgment. 
Okay, so now you have to ask a question again, different scripture, you ask the question again. What happens as a result of this fiery devouring of the earth? What happens? Does the earth become crispy? I mean, literally, does it become useless because the fire burned it out and took all of the goodness and all of the life right out of it? To find the answer, all you need to do is look at the next verse in Zephaniah chapter 3. Jonathan, let's go to verse 9. For then I will give to the people's purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. So if the earth was burned, where are all these people who still have lips that are calling on the name of the Lord? This is the conversion of those nations that were gathered to serve God. Are they in heaven? All right, that's a good question. Where are these people? Because it says right after this this devastation of this burning, there's purified lips. Well, verses 10 and 11 tell us about that. Jonathan, let's go. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. In that day, you will feel no shame because of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from you from the midst your proud, exalting ones, and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain. So the answer is, it's on earth. Surprise, surprise. It talks about from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So There's no Ethiopia in heaven that I know of. Well, no. scriptures don't tell us that, that's for sure. So folks, the idea is though, even though Zephaniah says you've got the, the, the earth being devoured by the fire of his zeal, you also have the assurance that planet Earth wasn't, and that we have a symbol, because it shows you in the next verses what happens. Okay, so we've got that one scripture that's, that's very dramatic. Let's go through several other Old Testament writers now, and look at what they say about the destiny of planet Earth. Does the Earth abide forever, or is the Earth meant for destruction? You've got two very dramatically different potential end results, what do the scriptures say? Well, Moses, the writer of the first five books of the Bible, gave us the earliest view of God's clear intentions for the earth. This statement takes place right after the great flood that Peter had alluded to in our first scripture. Genesis, Jonathan, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 to 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never destroy again every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, technically... <laughs> Rick, it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. So there is a thought of this repetition and continuance, but it is conditional to be as long as the earth is still here. I don't think this on its own proves that the earth remains forever, but that's why I love a topical Bible study like we're doing here, because I we can bring in supporting scriptures. Okay, so, and you're right. This doesn't prove that the earth abides forever by itself. But what it does prove, let's not overlook what it does prove, it says... God says, I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. That's the point of starting here. You have that worldwide destruction of heaven and earth that Peter described that just happened, and God says, I'm not going to ever do that again. So if we say, well, the earth's going to be burned up with fire, God therefore contradicts himself. God doesn't. So what we take from this scripture is the affirmative statement that says, I'll never again do that. Now, let's build on the abiding of the earth. So we've got Moses weighing in, you know, after the flood, giving us the, the, the record after the flood. Now we have a specific statement by Solomon defining God's plan of perp perpetuity for planet earth. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Okay, so Julie, how about that one? But the earth remains forever. 
Uh, that seems pretty plain. I like that one. So now what you have is a promise from God in the Genesis scripture, and now you have a sense of the earth remains forever. Well, what does forever mean in this verse? Jonathan, what's the definition? Well, it means concealed. That is the vanishing point. Generally, time out of mind, past or future. That is practically eternity. So the idea, and and I like the idea of the vanishing point. You know, when you look at the horizon, if you're in a very flat area for miles and miles, you look at the horizon, at some point it looks like the world ends. But if you keep walking, there's still more horizon, and there's still more horizon. And the idea is It's beyond the vanishing point. So it goes on beyond what you can even imagine. And that's as as, as strong a a word as you can get to say perpetuity, except for the next verse, because the next verse is going to add on to that exact word. So Solomon says the earth abides forever. The earth remains forever. It's over the beyond the vanishing point, beyond what anybody can ever, ever see. David now, let's go to another Old Testament writer. David brings unmistakable emphasis to the perpetuity of earth. Psalm 104, verse 5. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. Okay, so Jonathan, when you read that, there's two forevers, right? There is. The first one we've already defined. Right. It was the same word, but now it's got another word. It says forever beyond the vanishing point, and then it says, and ever. What does that second ever actually mean? It means duration in the sense of advance or perpetuity. So now you're building on the Ecclesiastes scripture, and you're seeing that it is a perpetual thing. It just is a self-fulfilling movement forward that doesn't ever stop. Yeah, the earth just doesn't go away. Yeah, you know what? It's like if you're in outer space. You know, the last time you were in outer space, did you try this? Here's here's a question for you. <laughs> you t- you take something because you're it's weightless and you throw it. Whatever you throw in outer space is just going to keep going and going and going and going and going and going because there's nothing to stop it. Okay, there's no gravity. There's no there's no pull anywhere, and that's the sense of the Earth. It it's being described as a planet of being in perpetuity, not being burned up. Okay, so now what? We've got a planet that the scriptures tell us unequivocally is not burned up. Now let's take a look at reasons. Isaiah, another Old Testament writer, adds an unmistakable reason for God's clearly stated plan for the perpetuity of planet Earth. Let's look at Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. In one sense, I think we could say it's never been thoroughly inhabited. I pulled some statistics from ourworldanddata.org and only 29.1% of the earth is land, the rest is water. And of that, only 71% is habitable. The rest, which is about 27 million square miles is glaciers and barren lands like deserts and exposed rocks. And of the inhabited land, Only 1% is built up urban areas that include cities, towns, villages, roads, and human infrastructure. So there's a lot of room around here that needs to be rebalanced, but it's not thoroughly inhabited. But in Isaiah, God is saying, I am the Lord. I formed the earth to be inhabited. That's right. There's no ending on that. This is what it's formed for, and the earth abides forever. So now you get the sense of, Okay, does that mean it's inhabited by human beings forever? Good question. Let's go to the next scripture and find a really good answer. Let's go to another Old Testament writer. And again, we go through all of these different books of the Old Testament, folks, so that you can see plainly the Bible as a unit is teaching us something incredibly valuable that most of us miss. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel reinforces the perpetuity of the earth and its connection to the future of Israel. Jonathan, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 24 to 28, and two things. First of all, it talks about, it starts out, my servant David. This is a picture of Christ. Jesus was born of the house of David, and it's absolutely a picture of Christ in Christ's kingdom. That's, this is what we're going to, so when you hear my servant David, think Christ. The other thing I want you to listen for in this scripture is forever. How many times does this scripture talk about forever? Who's it talking about? It'll tell you. And how many times does it say forever? Go ahead. 
My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever." How many times does he say forever or everlasting? So several points here. First, they will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, unmistakably planet Earth. For how long? It says forever. Their sons and their sons' sons forever. And an everlasting promise. And God bringing his, his sanctuary into their midst forever. So you have a very clear picture. Planet Earth... Israel, God's promise, God's sanctuary, all there forever. And incidentally, it says, and the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. So now you've got other people in this picture forever on planet Earth. Folks, you can't make this up. Look at all the scriptures we talked about and how each one helps to build a superstructure of understanding God's plan. Finally, let's look at Daniel. Daniel was interpreting a dream by King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, this is the dream that he couldn't remember, and and, and Daniel comes through and, by God's grace, is able to interpret the dream. And as he interprets this dream, he reveals God's everlasting plans for all humanity on earth. So in the recounting of the dream, uh, we're going to read those verses first, Daniel 2, and just only a part, Daniel 2, verses 34 to 35. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you have in the dream this stone that destroys the statue, grinds it to dust, the wind blows it away, and this stone becomes a a great mountain and fills the earth. Now, obviously, this is a very, very symbolic picture, but you got the sense of planet Earth. Daniel, in his interpretation, says this in Daniel 2, verses 44 to 45. In those days of the kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so that the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel gives this dead-on prediction of the defeat of world powers in the correct order, represented by these different body parts of this giant statue of a man. It was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Eventually, the stone cut without hands strikes the statue down, starts to fill the whole earth. That stone is God's kingdom, a holy government. And I recommend two podcasts if you'd like to hear more about this. Episode 806, Why Was Daniel So Special? And 786, Why Do Historians Dislike Daniel So Much? Both of these are just excellent. So again, we have another picture of earth. And now it talks about God's kingdom filling the whole earth. And it follows Ezekiel so, so well. So you put all these things together and... And you see a picture of the earth abiding and people abiding on it, both Israel and the rest of the nations, okay? So no matter how we look at this, there are many scriptures that focus on many aspects of the everlasting nature of earth and the intentions behind it, and those intentions have to do with humanity forever on earth. So Jonathan, as we wrap this up, defining the destiny of planet earth, give it to us in a couple of lines. 
Well, the Bible is emphatic that the earth will always play a role in God's plan as a home for humanity. This simple truth calls many Christian conclusions into question. And you know, folks, what we're doing is we're trying to go to the scriptures and let the scriptures do the talking as we bring up things that you're, you might be hearing and saying, what are you talking about? And the answer is, look up the scriptures. Let's follow what the Word of God says. The details and the variety of sources about Earth's future are very convincing. God's Word is so inspiring. With the Earth established as a future domain for humanity, should our view of heaven change? Well, we define heaven as the spiritual realm outside of our earthly understanding in which God and his holy angels dwell. While this realm is unfathomable to our simple human minds, we are given a lot to go on in terms of understanding how it fits in with the future of a select few who follow Christ. So now we're going to take a look at the idea of heaven. And we need to note that until Jesus came, there was never a promise or an expectation of a heavenly reward. So that represents millions of people who never heard the name of Jesus. They had no expectation of heaven. And Rick and Julie, to be clear, we're not minimizing heaven, but don't forget the earth. Yeah, yeah, and and that's exactly the point. We had to establish first the idea that the earth not only abides forever, but has an eternal purpose for humanity forever. Why do we say that? Because the scriptures have told us that again and again and again. And incidentally, we only scratched the surface with the number of scriptures that say that. Part two, we're going to get into it a whole lot more. But let's take a look at heaven now. Important aspects of heaven that are revealed throughout the New Testament. The first aspect of heaven is opportunity. Jesus introduced the concept of heavenly glory through, uh, though his disciples were not able to grasp it. They couldn't understand. Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You wonder how many of those disciples at that point during the Sermon on the Mount thought, did he just say heaven? What is he talking about? Because you're right, Julie, what you said before, you didn't have discussion of being in heaven before Jesus, and yet he brings this up, and it's a completely foreign idea that he had to build on and explain. So Jesus opened an opportunity for heaven, unequivocally. Next, we talk about the place, okay? So these aspects of heaven are revealed through Jesus, the, the, the opportunity and now the place. Jesus, before his crucifixion, made sure his followers knew they were going to have a specific place with him in heaven. And folks, you probably all know the scripture, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We all want to know what heaven's like. And here we're told it's being renovated, or perhaps a new section is being built just for the faithful followers of Jesus. So it doesn't give us a lot of information to satisfy our curiosity, but we do know that Jesus will be there. So I think that's the important part. Yeah, and I go to prepare a place for you. There's something very, very unique about whatever it is Jesus is doing to prepare for his followers. So you've got opportunity that he opens up for the first time ever, and the place that is completely unique, that has never existed that way in heaven before. Next, we have the comparative value of life here and life in heaven. What waits for Jesus' faithful followers is an eternal existence far beyond beyond any human experience. And we can see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So you got comparisons here. you got the things which are seen, temporal versus eternal. That means the things that we don't see here 
are not what is in heaven. It's a very different environment. And he says, look, you're having momentary light affliction. Now, if you've ever had trauma in your life, it does not feel like momentary light affliction. Okay? It just doesn't. It's hard, and it's weighty, and it can go on for a long time. But the point is that long time here on earth is a flicker in terms of time and the glory and the magnificence of heaven. So the comparative value of earthly experience to heavenly experience, is there, it's beyond comparison. So we've got the opportunity that Jesus opens up, the place that he uniquely prepares, and the comparative value which says you can't even put the two in, in the same context because they're so different. Now let's talk about the inheritance of heaven. See, heaven, folks, we, we establish that earth is a real thing here and now and in the future. Heaven is a very real thing now and in the future. The inheritance of heaven. Jesus' disciples will share glory with Jesus. You know, and a lot of Christians say that. Oh, I want to share in glory with Jesus. Do we even think about what that is? means. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 17 through 22. We'll take it in a couple of pieces. Let's do 17 and 18 to start with. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Sufferings of this present time give you a sense of what our Christian life looks like. We're going to get more into that in the next segment. But it talks about the glory to be revealed with us. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. Think about that for a second. Just pause and consider glorified with Jesus. Not glorified because of Jesus in some other place, but glorified with him. This is huge. This is I, I have a hard time. I can't even think about this stuff because it is too big for my little brain. I just can't wrap my head, even begin to wrap my head around what this is. And there's more. There's so much more to heaven. So we've got opportunity, place, comparative value, inheritance. There's also a mission involved. And this is the big thing. There's a mission. Heaven's call has everything to do with the blessing of the sin-sick world that we're in, uh, who long for deliverance. We're in Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 19 through 22. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers with pains of childbirth together until now. So I'm seeing two groups described here. I see one who is freed from slavery and the other group that's helping facilitate the slave's release. So there is a mission, Rick, attached to heaven. Yeah, and, and think about this, because the followers of Christ, again, we're going to get more into this in the next segment, but they're, they're called the sons of God or the children of God. And it says in this Roman scripture, pay attention to this, it says that um, the creation also will be set free from its slavery into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So Julie, when you said you see two groups, you see the children of God and the everybody else. That's right. And, and the everybody else is invited into the freedom of the children of God. That's part of the mission. They groan in, 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 the, in the suffering and pain because of sin. And the mission is that mission of reconciliation that uh, we've talked about so many times. So the mission is a big thing. It's not like heaven is a place where you go to sit still or go to relax or go to lay back on a hammock with a glass of iced tea. That's not heaven. Heaven is working the works of the almighty God. And that is a wonderful work to do. There's another aspect of heaven that, again, is just too big to, 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 to really grasp. And that's closeness the closeness that we'll have to God if we're faithful. If Jesus' disciples are going to be with Jesus, and Jesus is at the right hand of God, <laughs> that puts his disciples in the most sacred position imaginable. Can you imagine? That's unbelievable. No, I can't. I cannot even, I, it's too big. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 
Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Okay. So Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and you will also be revealed with him in glory. That puts you pretty close to the almighty creator himself. I mean, folks, heaven is no small matter. It is a massive, massive, massive privilege that is far beyond any human being who ever existed. There's nothing any of us can do that can actually earn this. There's a finality to heaven. And it's a glorious finality, I might add. Heaven will mean everlasting life. Revelation 2.10, the last part of Revelation 2.10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You know, the, the, when you talk about the crowning accomplishment of somebody, it's that final accomplishment, that final greatest thing, the crown of life. What does that mean? It, you know, let's talk about heavens, especially for, for those called to follow Christ, the type of heavenly nature they will have. And look, we've talked about a lot of things that are pretty amazing, and I, you know, I can't get my head around any of them. This next one blows the rest of them away, okay? The type of heavenly nature. This is not just everlasting life. This is divine nature. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Okay, you may be partakers of the divine nature. What is the divine nature? It's immortality. What does that mean? That means life perpetuates from within you. You need nothing on the outside, and you are a self-perpetuating being, which is completely indestructible. That is what divine nature is. You are death-proof. This is not easily earned. God does not just arbitrarily give this divine nature out. This is something that we have to make sure we are clear in our, our faith so that, that we could be trusted with such a thing. And again, we're going to get into that much more in, in the next segment. But there's a lot to this idea of deathlessness, and it's rare. God has it, Jesus has it, and those who follow Jesus will have it. And that's it. Well, these aren't just good people that go to heaven. The individuals have sacrificed their will and life and become crystallized in Christ likeness so that once they are released from this human condition, they will not flinch in anything in relation to God's will. The test has to be to our very core. God must know that uh, we are eternally loyal. Yeah, yeah, just absolutely eternally loyal. And that reminds me of, um, you know, Satan. You know, we God wouldn't be able to take the chance of someone being a Satan. He was faithful. He was born as an or created as an angel. Uh, it was a glorified by God. But something happened when he decided he wanted to be like the Most High. Remember in Isaiah fourteen fourteen, he said that Satan was and is very powerful, and great power will find the worst in you. So, can you just imagine if Satan had this divine nature? It, he would be immortal and wouldn't be able to be killed. So uh, so these people, these um, followers of Christ, really have to be tested. And it's important to note that this upward call of the or high calling, depending on the translation, to be a partaker of the divine nature, it's not to be an angel. There's no scripture that hints that when man dies, he turns into an angel sitting on a cloud with a harp, or as you said, Rick, an iced tea, don't know where that came from, um, <laughs> protecting their loved ones, you know, looking down from on high. This is much bigger. This is a much higher plane of existence than the angels. Uh, episode 1100, do people turn into angels when they die? We go into that in a lot more detail. But 1 Corinthians 6.3 tells us that one of the responsibilities of this divine class will be to judge the angels. 
And that Greek word judge, krino, means to rule or govern. So this group is going to have a, some authority over the angels. It's a it's the highest position in the universe. Yeah, it, it, it is beyond our, our comprehension. So heaven is a real thing. It's a real thing. Just like the earth abiding forever and being a home for humanity, that's a real thing. Heaven in its glory is a very real thing. So Jonathan, defining the destination of heaven, what is it? The heavenly realm is no small matter. Jesus emphatically taught us that its power and glory and station are being prepared for his disciples. And we cannot take that lightly, not for one second. The Bible gives us a tiny glimpse of how magnificent heaven is. Imagine all the things we don't know. Exactly who is going to heaven? Is such glory and power being offered to anyone who loves Jesus? You know, th this, this does not have to be a hard question to answer. Let's think for a moment about Satan having once been a mighty, God-serving spiritual being and how his pride brought him down, just like Julie was saying before. Do we think for one moment that God would offer such power to millions who were not first thoroughly tested? Think about that question. That's a big question. Would God offer deathlessness because you like him? to you. Think about that. Well, I'll, I'll answer that for you. No. <laughs> Heaven's not arbitrary. There's nothing minimal about it. And our two low standards have admitted to membership in, in all our denominations of Christianity, millions who are far below the master's standards. And when faced with this choice of only heaven or hell, our loving natures want to put everyone that we know and like, you know, all the quote, good people, in heaven, regardless of how dedicated they've been. So, yeah, and you know, and the other thing is, folks, in part two, we're going to address the idea of hell, because frankly, we don't believe that it is at all a scriptural concept, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in part two. But the idea, Julie, that, that Julie was bringing out is that, you know, when we think about, well, it's either heaven or hell, we've oversimplified something that has great, profound meaning. You see how profound heaven is. We see how profound the fact is that the earth abides forever and houses humanity forever because that's what the Bible says. Now let's look at the important aspects of how those who go to heaven are required to live their lives. How do you get to heaven? Pay attention here. This will describe it to you. We're going to begin with what the call will look like. And we're just going to rely on Jesus' words to describe to us what this call looks like. First of all, only being called of God and accepting uh, that call brings the offer of discipleship. You have to be called of God. How do we know? John six forty four. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is important because, you know, there's millions of people who died before Christ and never heard his name. But we have many more millions and maybe even billions who have heard of Jesus but whom the Father has never called. And there's no scriptural loophole to get those people into heaven. But they sure include an awful lot of what we would call, air quote, good people. So where do they go? You know, we talked about the earth abiding forever and people being out on the earth for a reason. And we're only using 1% of it? Yeah. So the idea that they go to earth is a very viable scriptural answer. Again, part two, we're going to develop that much further. So let's focus in now on this call to go to heaven. You have to be called by God, okay? That's the first step. The path to follow Jesus is difficult. It's a difficult and rarely traveled path. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, you know, we look at that and it talks about a narrow gate and a narrow way that leads to life and only a few find it. And then you've got this broad way that leads to destruction. And many of you are thinking, aha, you see, there's hell. No, the word is destruction, not torture. There's a big difference. We're going to develop this further in part two as well. But the point is, it's a difficult road to follow Jesus. How do we know? Look at Jesus' life. Was it easy? No. A footstep follower of Jesus means you're walking right behind him, willing to do what he did. He lived a difficult life because his life was here for sacrifice. So we've got being called of God, 
being willing to walk a difficult path. Following Jesus also means walking, like we said, in his footsteps. It means be, being willing to be selfless. Luke 9, 23 to 24. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. And Rick, this just sounds like we die daily for Christ. And that's the point. I'm, are, am I willing to lose my life for Christ? That's what Jesus himself is saying. You must be willing to be selfless. Am I willing to lose myself in doing the will of God? That's the point. That's why being a Christian is hard. And I'm not trying to scare you, but we are trying to be scriptural in terms of understanding this. And, you know, because it's so hard, this next scripture makes a whole lot of sense. It's expected that we think through such a decision to be an actual follower of Christ. We think through this decision with great care. Jesus describes this to us, Luke 14, 27 to 28. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? This calling goes just beyond, uh, you know, just beyond loving Jesus or accepting him as your personal savior. It's a difference between being a fan and being a disciple. And we went over that a lot in the episode 1070. Does being a Christian have to be difficult? Fan or disciple? Yeah, you know, and, and that's a great illustration. And folks, look, we're not discouraging anyone from loving Jesus and coming to him and, and accepting him as your personal savior. That's wonderful. But if you're going to be a true disciple, there has to be the thinking of, am I willing to give up everything for the sake of Christ? Am I willing to walk in his footsteps to do the will of God always instead of my own, whatever trial or tribulation might come? That's the difference. And we talked about how big heaven is and what the reward is, how massive it is. God doesn't give that reward out lightly. And that's why all of these things are in the scriptures for us to understand what true discipleship is. So we begin with what the call looks like in Jesus' words. Now let's go to the epistles and figure out the daily experiences of those called to go and follow Jesus and then go to heaven. This, so now we're picking up with, we saw what it looks like. Now let's look at the daily experiences of a true Christian. A disciple of Jesus never stops focusing on sacrificing their own will for God's will. We know this through Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's important to note that this is an invitation. It's not a command. Present your bodies a holy, I urge you, a holy and living sacrifice. The Lord's people aren't commanded to present their bodies or walk in Jesus's footsteps and take up this cross and follow him because voluntary service to God, you, you think it's a privilege and it's an opportunity. And it's by grace that we even have that option. So we are invited to such a life we don't necessarily have to accept. It's, it's a great, great, great privilege to accept. Once we do accept, though, we accept the, 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 uh, the guidelines that are laid out for us. And we do want to live our lives according to that privilege of sacrifice. So Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about transforming yourselves by the renewing of your mind, by that Holy Spirit working within you. Let's continue. A disciple of Jesus is not exempt from sin, but they do need to ask forgiveness for their sins. So just because we're a disciple doesn't mean we, we don't sin anymore. First John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Make no mistake, even those of us who are very faithful Christians, and I've known some very faithful Christians in my time, they were still sinful human beings. But they were able to bring those sins to the throne of grace and through Jesus, Jesus being the satisfaction for those sins. 
we must recognize our sins and be repentant. It's not just an, enough to say, I'm sorry. We have to live repentant lives for those sins. It's required of us as Christians to do that. A disciple of Jesus' most important goal in life is their faithfulness. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, if you learned obedience, if Jesus, I'm sorry, if Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered, which is found in Hebrews 5, 8, why shouldn't we? <laughs> Good point. And Jonathan was reading from the New American Standard Version when he called it the prize of the upward call of God. In King James, it's called the prize of the high calling. And that's something we may be more familiar with. So, you know, when we look at this, and, and actually Trish just handed me a note as she's listening, and she said, you know, you said we have to give up everything to follow Christ. Yes, we said that. So, so should we not work, have a home, or have a family? No, that's not necessarily what that's saying at all. What it's saying is everything you do, and there are scriptures that enhance this, everything you do, you do as unto the Lord. You do it in a sacrificial way that you are offering your livelihood to God and your home in his service. And you teach your children the things that they need to be taught. You look in the New Testament, and it's full of individuals. You have those, those key individuals that did give up everything and, and didn't have any of those things, but the everybody else, the other faithful Christians, did. So let's not, let's not make a mistake and say, well, I have to be exactly like the Apostle Paul. No, you don't. The Apostle Paul was called to be the Apostle Paul. He stayed with individuals. There were people who helped to support him. How did they do that? They worked. So, you know, you have a sense of being a steward of your life, being responsible for your life, and living it for the sake of godliness. So we've got this high calling, this goal of being faithful in our lives. Let's continue. A disciple of Jesus will be tried and tested to show their fidelity to Christ. This is an important factor. First, uh, First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. It's important to realize that the whole world is now not on trial for this eternal life in heaven. It's only those who have been called of God and are running for that prize of the high calling. All of these other people, they are not lost if they don't accept Jesus now in this lifetime. And I think that's where a lot of denominations and a lot of traditions go wrong and people get very confused over what's going to happen to all these people who are good, but not good enough. And we're going to talk about that again in part two. So next week, you don't want to miss that because we're going to put, 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 connect those dots. That we, we, right now, we're focusing very specifically on what does it take to get to heaven? And the answer is a lot. The answer is everything. We just need to keep moving forward. You know, the idea of a fiery ordeal which comes upon you. It's a purifying. Fire can destroy and fire can purify. We are being purified by our difficult experiences. A disciple of Jesus understands their training now is for a higher purpose later. And we alluded to this earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 from the Weymouth translation. And all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ has appointed to us to serve in the ministry of reconciliation. We are to tell how God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not charging men's transgressions to their account, and that he has entrusted to us the message of this reconciliation. We, on Christ's behalf, beseech men to be reconciled to God. You know, Julie just said that everybody's not on trial, and that's where we see God is reconciling. He's got a plan for reconciling the world to himself. 
not just Christians, but the world to himself, and we are the ministers of that reconciliation. We're being trained now for that higher purpose later. A disciple of Jesus is focused on the future, both for themselves and for the world that they will serve. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay, glorify God in the day of visitation. What is the day of visitation? It's the day of judgment. It is the day when all things begin to be made right. So a disciple of Jesus is focused on the future, and the witness that we give now will be reflected in that day of visitation, and it will be a good reflection upon the will of God. So we see getting to heaven is difficult, not impossible, but difficult, and it is for the called out ones. So Jonathan, let's wrap this up, defining the discipline of those called to heaven. Simply loving Jesus and going to church will not get anyone to heaven. Being called begotten by God's Spirit, dedication, sacrifice, selflessness, faith, perseverance, and love get us to heaven. This is not an easy path to follow. No, it's not. So we've talked about a lot of things here. Folks, as we wrap up part one of Did God Make Heaven and Hell Humanity's Destiny, several Bible truths have become evident. First, the earth not only abides forever, It will house the masses of humanity during that forever. And we're going to deal with that big time next week. Second, heaven is being prepared for Jesus' disciples, and their position will be one of great power and glory. Third, those who go to heaven are few and far between as it takes effort, sacrifice, and faithfulness. Now, these conclusions may be odd, may be different, and they raise many questions. And again, next week we're going to work on those questions. First, If the earth will house humanity, what happens to hell? Is it a legitimate biblical teaching? Next, how would all those people who don't go to heaven have a right to live on earth? Doesn't that contradict the whole idea of being saved? All coming next week. There's so much to God's plan. Think about it. Folks, listen, we do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our podcast is subscribing to Christian Questions in your favorite podcast channel, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate us and review us. We'd greatly appreciate it. And once again, next week, Did God Make Heaven and Hell? Humanity's Destiny, Part 2. Talk to you then.